really appreciate those. Early on, Paul really kind of gets after the brethren in Galatia. He loves them, he cares about them, but he's concerned that they are departing from the gospel. And he marvels that this has happened so quickly. If you'll notice in Galatians 1, 8 and 9, 1 and 8 and 1 and 9, it says, Though we or an angel should teach you anything other than that which you've been taught, let him be anathema or let him be accursed. Verse 9, he repeats it. So apparently he really means this here. Let me give you a little hint. If you have a couple of young fellows come by your house, white shirts, black ties, with a little name tag on their jacket right here, and it says elder so-and-so, and they're about 18 or 19 years old. If you use this passage of Scripture, you have to be careful with it. If you say, you're teaching a different gospel, or Joseph Smith revealed a different gospel, they will say, what is the gospel? And it's very easy to do a knee-jerk reaction. You say, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. And they said, we believe that too. And then you kind of left out to dry. I know, because it happened to me. But it's better to define the gospel as the totality of Christ's message for us, mission for us, and the work of the church. It considers the, the totality of Christ coming for us in his redemptive power. And that gospel is different from the gospel of the LDS and many others. Paul had to de defend his apostleship all the time. The Jews felt like this. Either you had to be a Jew to become a, a Christian, or you had to do everything that the Jews did. You had to keep the law. You had to keep the... the the Sabbath days, you had to make sure that you were actually more of a Jew than you were a Christian. You were a Jewish Christian, as opposed to just being a New Testament Christian. And Paul warned them about this. In fact, he has done so repeatedly to do this, not to yield to the false gospel. We have false gospels today. I might ask the question to of you, would you, re, would you recognize a false gospel if you heard one? One time in a Bible school class, young adults, I intentionally taught some stuff that was wrong. And the students went like this. It, you could tell that was messing up their minds. They wanted to agree with me. They knew me. They knew that I wanted to teach the truth, and I always had. But what they were hearing wasn't, wasn't right. And we have to be alert, sharp. We have to be on the watch for false gospels just like they were then. Peter and Barnabas really did a bad thing. They were there in Antioch. Peter was there in Antioch. And the gospel had already come to the Gentiles. But then when the big shots came down from Jerusalem, even though the direction is up, when they came down from Jerusalem, when they had their love feast, Peter didn't want to be seen with the Gentiles. And unfortunately, Barnabas was with him. And Paul called him out on this. Now, if Peter were a pope, this is certainly strange behavior. Because Peter, Paul condemned him. He said he was to, to be blank. Which just simply shows that if Peter and Barnabas and others like that can fall, we can too. And we have to constantly be awake. Paul says that I have been crucified with Christ. We remember from the passage in Romans 6, 3 through 6. Know you not as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And Paul considered himself to be a different person. He was not the old Paul that was of the Jewish faith. He was not the old Paul that persecuted the Christians. He was a, the Christian Paul that was on the receiving end of, of criticism, 
the crit and the and persecution over and over again. But Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. The old law, the law of Moses, pointed out mistakes and showed people where they were in error. The new law in Christ shows us the error and also gives us a way to be whole and be clean again. The, the Gentiles were justified by faith. In contrast to the Jews who said, we believe in Abraham. We have Abraham for our father. And they felt that that plus keeping the, the different holy days was good enough. The Gentiles, though, are saved by faith the same way Abraham was. How was it that Abraham was saved by faith? By completely trusting that God would look out for him and had his best interest at heart. He put his trust in God. And that's how we as Gentiles can come to Christ as well when we put our total, complete confidence that, that Christ is concerned about us, that God watches over us. We might say in the vernacular, he has our back. He's looking out for us. So we do not have to worry about who God is or where he is. The law was a tutor to bring us to Christ. The word there, tutor, is pedagogos, where we get the word pedagogue. And that individual was usually an older, wiser servant in the household. And his job and his responsibility was this, to make sure that the children got their education both in their formal education and also their informal education. That they associated with the right kind of people. That they went to their classes and they were there on time. And they, they, that they grew up to, to mirror the master, their, their father. And this was the purpose of the Old Testament. Paul talked about this in, in Romans. He said, I wouldn't have known what coveting was if the Lord said, Thou shalt not covet. That was the purpose of the old law. The Gentiles before the time of Christ were in a law to themselves, the law of their own conscience. But the, the Israelites, the Jews, were, were, were brought to Christ by the old law. In the old law, if someone wanted to become a Jew, they would trim his fingernails, they would cut his hair, and they would baptize him. They would baptize him. And when he came out, they were considered to be a different person than the person that went in there. All their debts were forgiven. Everything was a new, it was like just turning over a new leaf. Unfortunately, this became such a source of pride among the Jews that they thought that just being a Jew was enough to be saved. And they would sometimes offer this prayer, I'm so grateful, God, that I am not a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. That's how ornery they got. That's how focused they got on their own religion. Paul says that we have been baptized into Christ and just like Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ, you and I have put on Christ as new creatures. And notice that he says into Christ. There is no passage of scripture that says that you can believe into Christ. That you can repent into Christ. That you can re uh, pray into Christ or any other way into Christ except to be baptized into Christ. Galatians 3.27 is a passage that you need to remember and be familiar with. Again, Paul gets after them for their Jewish tendencies. Observing times and, and, and holiday, holy days. And the Jewish, in the Jewish mind went something like this. If I keep the law of Moses, 
if I observe the holy days, then I'm holy. And there was an unstated, but a very, very strongly implied uh, sentence that went, that went with that, and that is, I really deserve to be saved. The Jews felt like on their own that they, that they could be saved. In Colossians 2, Paul says, Let no man judge you in respect of meat or drink or Sabbath day. Those things are all past. Unfortunately, in Galatia, Paul had to fight with the Jewish people to return to Judaism. And what that was, that was actually a return to slavery, to the old law. The old law with its, all its uh, ramifications and all of its requirements. Paul had a real sweet uh, outlook and at, uh, attitude as far as talking to others is concerned. Even though he got after the Gentiles a little bit, he still referred to them as brethren. And his tenderness comes through several times in the letter that he cares about the, the Galatians, that he's interested in them and has their best interest in heart. And then he asks the words, do I become your enemy by telling you the truth? It is very, very strange difficult to confront someone that we think is in error. It's a challenge to us. It's easier to say, well, I want to be a peacemaker and just let things go. But that's not the way Paul taught us to do it. Paul taught us that if there is error, then we tell the truth. Now, how you tell the truth is a whole different matter. I have heard preachers talk about people going to hell and they sounded almost glad that they were able to preach that. In fact, I know of one preacher after Carl Sagan passed away, the astronomer passed away. This one preacher wrote a bulletin article basically that said Carl Sagan is in hell and he deserves to be there. Pretty much along that line, not those exact words, but that was the intent and the meaning of what he was talking about there. How we approach someone, if they can see the love and concern and compassion, that makes all the difference in the world. Let me suggest this. If there's someone that you want to talk to about something that they've said or done, approach it this way. It appears to me that you did such and such. Or, I understand that this is what you did. Or, it's my belief, if I see this correctly, that this is what you did. Always put it in a, a situation where, that if you are mistaken, they can immediately correct you right there. I've had people to do this. I thought we were making a mistake. I said, if I understand this correctly, and if I see what you're doing here, that doesn't look right. And they say, you didn't see the whole thing. And they tell me the whole story. And most people are appreciative. When I was in Abilene uh, trying to finish up school there, I was very fortunate to get a job for a dollar and a quarter an hour unloading freight cars in a warehouse. And that was a good job. It was hot and it was hard and it was difficult. And one thing I especially liked about it was that the owner of the warehouse was a Christian. And I liked the idea of working with a Christian. Until one day I heard him using the same language that those other warehousemen were using. And it's not language that a Christian would use. So I was in a dilemma. If I say something about it, I could lose my job, meaning I'm going to have to quit school. I'm going to have to quit school and support my wife and myself if I lose my job. But then I realized that even if that happened, that I had to confront him and let him know what he had done. And I went to him. I said, Brother so-and-so, did you realize the other day that when these warehousemen were talking like this, that you joined them and that you said the same thing? He says, oh, no. He says, I can't believe I did that. 
He says, I worry about that all the time because I'm around them so much. And I thought that I did not do that. And I am so sorry that I did it. And I, I appreciate you coming to me. Let me assure you, they all won't go that smoothly. Sometimes they're not going to be... Uh, they're not going to be welcome at all because you're telling the truth. Notice in Galatians 5, 4, their desire to, to bring in the Judaism into their Christianity, he says, you have fallen from grace. Now, in my Bible, I've underlined this, and in the margins, I've written a whole bunch of different scriptures. Because this confronts Calvinism. Calvinism says, once saved, always saved. And some of our religious friends and denominational neighbors, that's what they believe. They are honest and sincere in this, but they, but they actually believe this. That once you're saved, that you're always saved. And one of the things they try to counter with this is this. Well, if I'm not saved, then why did I become a Christian? I will worry all the time that I'm, that I'm going to fall away. When in reality, when you live the Christian life, when you li walk the Christian walk, the blood of Christ continually cleanses us spiritually and forgives us of all the errors and the weaknesses that we have. But you've fallen from grace. This and many other passages in the New Testament teach that you can fall from grace. Think about this. Whenever you hear a particular doctrine... Track it down and just follow what the implications of that doctrine are. And if the implications are false, then the doctrines are false. Okay, the doctrine is you're falling from grace. And we're going to say you cannot fall from grace. We follow it down and what it means is that Christians have lost their power of choice. They can't choose between good and evil anymore because once saved, they're always saved. In the Baptist seminaries, they came up with a, a, a cute little phrase. It says, the faith that fails was a failure from the first. Say that, try to say that about three or four times. The faith that fails was a failure from the first. And what they mean by that is this. If someone becomes a Christian and then starts doing things that are, are against Christ and against Christianity, then really deep down they weren't converted to begin with at all. You cannot fall from some place you've never been. And Paul says it specifically. Our religious friends say you cannot fall from grace. Paul says you have fallen from grace. And that, that pretty much settles it. Now, we're going to see through the letters, not only this letter, but the other letters as well, that Paul continually emphasizes love. The story is told, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's told that when the Apostle John was way on up in years, he came in and addressed a body of believers. And he talked to them about loving one another. And the next day they asked him if he would speak again. So he spoke again about loving one another. And they were a little bit uncomfortable, but you know, he's, he's an er elderly man. He, he's forgetful. He didn't remember that he preached that the day before. So he spoke the third day and spoke the same lesson. And afterwards, one person had enough courage to come up and say, uh, Brother, you've preached the same sermon on love three days in a row. And John said, I know that. And whenever you learn that, then I'll preach something else. Sometimes, with our brothers and sisters, we may have a love for them, but we don't like what they do. This is the difference between condemning somebody and encouraging somebody. We have the worth of the individual. We're concerned about their soul. We're concerned about something that they have done. And love compels us 
to help them overcome whatever it is. In our house, our boys have never, ever heard the words, you're a bad boy. And may I suggest that if you use that term with your kids or grandkids, that you never say, you're a bad kid, because the kid takes that at, at face value. You're an adult, so he believes it. What we say is, you made some bad choices. You have a good heart, and you want to do what's right, and you've been taught better than that. But... You made some bad choices. Paul emphasizes two things through his letters. One is love and the other to avoid covetousness. The, uh, <clears throat> the Christians back then were basically like the word, like the, the Romans were, in that they felt like that there was the spirit and the body were so different that the body could sin could do anything it wants to, and the spirit was untouched. But listen to what Paul says about it. <clears throat> but if you're led by the spirit, then you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, that's just made known or evident, which are these. Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousies, wrath, Factions, divisions, partings, envyings, drunkenness, revelings, reveling of such like, which, of which I forewarn you, even as I did forewarn you, that those who practice such things should not inherit the kingdom of God. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and good and faithfulness, meekness and self-control. Against those things there is no law. Again, <clears throat> The, the, if the body sins, then the entire person has sinned. If the body sins, then the person has sinned. He does have a spirit, he does have a body, but the two of them go together. In 6 verse 2, there's a very interesting challenge here. He says that if a brother is overtaken in a sin, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one. And he tells us to do it in a kind and loving, gentle spirit. Perhaps you've heard people say, well, you can't say anything to me because your skirts are dirty too. Or, I can quote Jesus. Let him that's innocent cast the first stone. And you're not innocent, so you can't say anything. Unfortunately, that is misapplying the Scriptures. The Scriptures do not say, ye who are perfect, restore such a one. The Scriptures say, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one. And spiritually minded people make mistakes. Spiritually minded people do things that are, that are wrong. We do not kill somebody if they have a broken leg. And I think Marilyn Jones is grateful for that. If somebody has a broken leg, then we do everything with tender, kindness, compassion. And we hope that that leg will heal. The Greek word that is used there is like mending a net. That, that they will be healed. And so there is healing that comes from people who are spiritual. Now notice this passage of Scripture right here. I'm going to go back and forth between these two, 6.2 and 6.5, because it looks like we have a contra contradiction. In 6.2 it says, bear one another's burdens. In 6.5 it says, each shall bear his own load or own burden. And people sometimes get a little bit confused by that. What he's saying in 6.2 is just simply this. It's like a military pact. I remember in basic training that one of our guys re really had a hard time in running. And we had a night, a night run one night. And this guy could not keep up. And some of the fellow soldiers took his pack, took his rifle, and encouraged him to where he could make the trip the whole way. This is the type of encouragement that we read about in the New Testament that we are challenged to do. Let me also mention something else. 
Sometimes when we find out that people have a difficulty or challenge in their lives, we're hit totally by shock that we didn't know such and such was happening in their lives. I don't know what the cure for this is. I've gone to people and said, you haven't been coming, I've been missing you, uh, there's a problem here. And then they go into a long list of problems and they are really sincere problems. They are real problems that I would hate to have. And they've been wrestling with them. And they've been doing it by themselves. Unless we make our love known that we're w willing to forgive, and unless we let our burdens be known, sometimes we bear them alone. Now, in 6.5, when it says, you should bear your, your own load, that is simply a responsibility or what you're supposed to do. In 6.2 he says, you help one another, you help bear his load. 6.5 he says, but you're responsible for yourself. So there's not a contradiction there. I'm going to get into deep water here. In Galatians 6.10 it says, do good to all men. I'm going to ask you a thought question. And <clears throat> don't just blurt it out right now because I've got a lot of material to cover. But call me aside privately and tell me the answer to this. Aside from a specifically stated sin, what constitutes an unscriptural expedient? And by expedient, I mean something that we do in following the Lord, in obeying the gospel, in worshiping the Lord. We know that there's different types of authority in the New Testament. There's, there's the direct words, the direct authority. There's the, by implication, there's also by example. So, <clears throat> anything that we need to do, as far as the church is concerned, we have authority to do that. Do we have authority to meet on Wednesday nights? Hmm. I don't know where it says in the New Testament they met on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. So therefore, you're, take, you're going beyond the Word. No. The elders have the responsibility to feed the flock. And this is the time that they, cho they have chosen for us to do that. Sometimes, people get hung up on the expedient, and they forget the principle. Example, is it a matter of scripture or a matter of opinion, an expedient, to have a church building? There are some congregations that meet in schools, and they pay the rent for the school, or in meeting halls. Is that scriptural? Well, certainly it is. We've been given the command to assemble on the first day of the week. Therefore, anything that is necessary or anything that follows observing that command is scriptural. And we can say that that is a scriptural command. It may not say it in the text, but it is implied. If it is scriptural to have a building, then it's scriptural to have a parking lot for the cars. If it's scriptural to have a building in a parking lot, it is scriptural to have a, a potluck in the building. And I know that there's some people who would disagree with me on that. And that is perfectly fine. If such is your belief that you should not eat in the church building, I will not condemn you, and I don't know of anyone else that will either, if that's what you honestly believe. But as far as scripture is concerned... It's an expedient. It's a way for us to have fellowship with one another, to get to know one another, besides just having a good meal. So, the challenge for your thinking is this. Unless it is a specific sin. Suppose the elder said, on New Year's Eve, we're going to have a drinking party here and see how drunk we can get. Okay? Now, that right there, I think, would probably cause us to say there are problems with it. We couldn't do that. But bar being an actual sin, is there any expedient that we could call unscriptural? 
He chose us, we're getting into the Ephesian letter now. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. You remember what I said a moment ago, that if there's a doctrine here, to fully understand it and to see how it applies to us, let's look at the implications. Calvinism says that God predetermined, preordained, foreknew who he was going to save and who he was going to damn. And nobody can change that. Either you're on the saved side that God knows ahead of time and that he did that, or you're lost. And there's nothing you can do to change that. In fact, there's nothing you can do to change either one of them. That's one of the tenets of Calvinism. But look at the problems that it causes. It causes us not to have free will. It causes the scriptures to be false. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, wait a minute, Lord. If you've already predetermined who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, why are you telling me that I can come to you when I really can't? In 2 Peter 3, 8, it says that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should have everlasting life. If that passage is true, then this Calvinistic idea of foreordination or preordination is not correct. May be honest and may be sincere, but honestly and sincerely wrong. Do not cease to give thanksgiving. Christ Jesus has given us an abundant life. And sometimes we need to just stop and take a break and remember what has been given to us. On one side, we have all the spiritual and temporal blessings that are in Christ Jesus that we we enjoy as Christians, as brothers and sisters, as children of the King. But fighting against that is covetousness a sense of being dissatisfied, of wanting more. Not going to ask for a show of hands. But I tell you what, this hits mighty close to home as far as I'm concerned about not being content and wanting more and more and more stuff. And after a while, you have so much stuff, you don't know what to do with it. So you have a garage sale or give it away. And it just comes by wanting too much stuff. Now... In 123, this is another important passage in Ephesians. It says the church is his body. He gave all things to be head over the church, which is his body. This is how significant Paul says through the Holy Spirit the church is. That it is the body of Christ. That means you and you and you and me. All of us are the body of Christ. And you don't have to go very far to find people that demean the church, that blame the church, that accuse the church of failing, of treating them wrong, of, of mistreatment and rejection. When it is not the church of Christ that does that. Sometimes individual members fail as far as their responsibility is excuse. Sometimes people look for an excuse to find some way to not be faithful to the church. And one way is this. If I can see the church and I see its flaws, I see the members that sin and I see the people that fall short, and they're encouraging me to, to do what's right, or they're not doing it themselves, so I don't have to do it either. We don't let our kids get away with that, and we can't get away with it either. Notice, if you will, a passage of Scripture that some of our denominational friends use, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For we're saved by grace, not by works that any man should boast. And if you have a religious discussion for very long with a 
member of a church, they will come to this passage of Scripture and they take it out and put it on a pedestal like it just was sitting there by itself. The problem with that is it's taking it out of context. Paul is warning the people in Ephesus as he did in Galatia not to go back to the old law. Not to go back to the law of Moses. Not to go back to a law of works. Why? Because you've been saved by grace. And then he says a little bit later on, I don't remember what he said a little bit. I know he said something. I can remember that, but I don't remember what he said. You're saved, yeah, context, you're saved through faith. The Jews thought that they were good enough to be saved on their own. Here's another thought challenge. And if you want to discuss this, give me a call or call me aside. I am willing to assert that we are saved only by grace, but not by grace only. And that may sound like a contradiction, but it really isn't. Being saved by grace includes repentance, confession, baptism, living a faithful life before God. Even if we do all of those perfectly, we fall short. And our salvation is because the Lord wants us to be saved, because He graciously gives us that salvation. But it's not by grace only. If it were by grace only, look at the implications. Grace of God is extended to every person. The grace of God is extended to every person. Therefore, if His grace extends to every person, and every person takes advantage of His grace, whether he wants to or not, then everybody's saved. Because grace was for everybody. But we know that that is not correct because Jesus said that some will be saved and some will be lost. And so, if you will remember the context of this particular passage of Scripture and that he was condemning or comparing the law of Moses versus the law of faith. In 2.10, just down the road a little bit, he says, you are created for good works. It's amazing what can happen a lot of times when you read a passage of Scripture and you read a little bit before it and a little bit after it. Because not talking about, not only is he not talking about doing good works, he there says, we are created for good works. In Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13, it says that you will be judged by your works. Our works will, will, will be judged. And that's what we're created for. Let me ask a question. What if the Anchorage Church of Christ disbanded tonight at 8 o'clock and did not meet anymore? What difference would it make? What difference would it make if a group of Christians said, we're not going to be Christians anymore. We're going to disband and not do that anymore. What would happen? Would it make any difference at all? Would people even notice what we have done or what we have not done? And unfortunately, we have not done a very good job in a watching world of carrying forth his banner. This is an important passage. He broke down the middle wall of petition that just simply says that he overcame the law of Moses. And we're built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and the apostles. This is another important question. Because many times our religious friends and denominational neighbors will talk about someone or some doctrine upon which they base their faith. But if you go back to the Bible, everything has a scriptural authority from Jesus and the apostles and the early church. I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to mention that Gentiles are fellow heirs. There's one body, 
if there's only one body and the body is the church, then there's only one church, which is his body. And unfortunately, people are not willing to accept that, that there's just the one. The general consensus is there are, there's one Lord, but many ways to get there. And many churches, and all of them are all right, and all of them do good. And while there may be some good done by individual churches, that is not what the New Testament says. The last verse that I want to finish up on is because someone asked this question, what, did, what does it mean that when he says, he led captivity captive? Once again, Paul is comparing the old law and the old law with the new. They were captive to the law of Moses. They were captive to sin. They were captive to a losing way of life. If you wanted to do a comparison, it would be like the triumph that the Roman Caesars were given, the Roman generals were given. Whenever they had a great victory, they would come back. They would bring animals that they had caught. They would bring captives that they'd caught trailing in the procession. And different rich ones would give them gifts. In the New Testament, and Paul plays on this just a little bit, he says, Christ has led all of those things captive. The implication is, we're free. And he gave gifts to men. If I may, let me go on one more passage of Scripture. There we go. I went past it. If you will, be sure and, and memorize or mark Ephesians 5.19 because there we have the authority for our music in worship. We don't go by the Old Testament. We don't go by music that may be in heaven. We don't go by tradition. We don't go by a vote of the elders. We go simply by the Word. Think about this. You remember I mentioned a, a moment ago, if there's a doctrine, look at the implications of it. If the word psalm or hymn or spiritual song means an instrumental music, an instrument of music, then each one of us must have one. Each one of us must have an instrument if that is true. And we know that that is not as true. Once again, thank you for your kind attention. And I'm sorry I had to miss out on some of those verses.